Welcome to Top M&A Entrepreneurs. This episode is brought to you by the Magnolia Firm. I just want to talk about three things that I found with the Magnolia Firm. You know, selling it or buying a business, it's not a zero-sum game. Both the buyer and seller can get what they want, and they're going to help you do that. Also, by working with them the last couple of months, they believe in full transferring when selling a business. So they make sure all their sellers are on the same page before they take them on as a client. And they do more due diligence on a seller than I've ever seen. So if you're interested in buying or selling a business, check out the Magnolia Firm. Welcome to the Top m a Entrepreneurs Podcast. Today, my guest is Kevin Peterson. Kevin, in his career, has been involved in over 50 acquisitions. Currently, he's running a uh, company called Growstack, where he's been involved in 30 for his company. And he also launched a mastermind for SaaS company founders, uh, which is pretty cool. So, Kevin, welcome to the show. John, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah. uh, and I'll just start off right out of the gate saying I'm super excited to be uh, doing this with you today because I feel like I have a lot to share for your listeners. And, and so just help me along with the brain dump. And I'm happy to happy to share all of my uh, knowledge and experience that I've acquired since I was five years old. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, what we do is uh, the hero's journey and we rewind and go, hey, Luke, what, uh, what was that planet you start on and what were you doing? So where did this all start? Yeah, so, uh, and I don't know if you really want me to go back to my five-year-old days, but no, I, just, I uh, am... I mean, I am the proverbial CEO that had a lemonade stand, right? There, I guess that is a common trait of, of CEOs and uh, people in the C-suite. So I was one of those guys that or kids who ran out and uh, set up a table with signs and put signage on the corners and sold. I, I actually did popcorn and lemonade. That was my, my angle. Ooh, um, popcorn too. Yeah. 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 And then uh, I started investing in the stock market when I was nine. And this was uh, pre-internet. So... Um, I was on a one day delay on, on any data. Yeah. Uh, it took at the time it took like two weeks to get a quarterly report or an annual report. Um, were and you so, reading these reports before you made these or what were you looking at the wall street journal or investors yeah, no, business daily yeah, was, or what was it? Yeah. Yeah. I was looking at, uh, uh, really just business section. I grew up in the Silicon Valley. So I was reading the business section of the San Jose Mercury news. Okay. And yeah. and looking at the tickers. So every morning before school, I'd get up and look at the tickers and, and read read uh, you know business news and and then make decisions about what I wanted to to do. Yeah. What was your best uh, winner? Well, I had really I had a really good run with uh, Cisco Foods, not not Cisco S -Y -S -C -O tech company. S Y S C O. Foods. Yes. yes yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And um, yeah, and funny story there. Like it was one of my best performing positions and um and i picked it when after school one day i was uh, eating pizza rolls uh you know you just heat them up out of the box right and i took a bite out of one and the filling fell out on the on the page with the tickers and it fell onto cisco foods <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah so i called uh, the broker that worked at my dad's office and i said hey i need a, a quarterly on cisco and he's like yeah sure and then and then i bought it and it was doing great and it was a dividend stock and it was it's always been up and to the right and um, and i liked it because they owned a lot of restaurants that i was familiar with as a kid so i was like I, you know they say invest in in what you know and i did know and frequent the restaurants that they own so i was like yeah i like this and so stock yeah, picking like, fundamentals 101 Right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, then uh, the broker at my dad's office uh, lovingly called him Uncle Marky, and he was like, "How did you like? Why did you pick that? How did you pick Cisco Foods?" And, like, and I told him the story about yeah, the pizza yeah. roll falling out. And he's like, "Ah, oh, you know, curses." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and then he comes back to you and gives you money to go invest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. What uh, What was a What was a big loser for you? Hmm. Um, so at a young age, I did learn the correlation between like interest rates and commodities. And, um, I almost hate to say it, but like, uh, political geopolitical strife and, uh, and certain stocks. And there were, there were things that I got into like, uh, in commodities specifically. So gold and oil, yeah. where, 
you know, I, uh, as a, you know, nine year old investor, I wasn't, um, I, and, and on a one day delay on the data, I wasn't able to really keep up with the moves, you know, like, um, frequent moves or frequent variants in commodities. So I didn't, I I'll, actually, I'll be honest, looking back, like in my lifetime, I've never done very well with commodities. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'm going to just wrap it up and give you the summary. Yeah. I don't think a nine-year-old can stay on top or surf above the global political impacts. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So so fast forward, uh, how did you start? Did you start building a company yourself? You're working for some other company or what was it? Yeah. So uh, in my 20s, I fell into a pre-IPO startup situation uh where uh the comp i was number 13 i had founder shares um the company did go public with sequoia in 1996 uh still so trading sequoia today London, bc yeah yeah yep and so, well they sponsored the yeah they sponsored the ipo and so um uh yeah still trading today four billion dollar market cap operating in 26 countries um, I was there when we opened the 10th branch. 10th branch. And, what was the name of the company? I was running all things. It's called On Assignment. Ticker is ASGN. On Assignment. And, okay. Uh, I was running all things marketing for about eight years. So, so is that it. the marketing part? How did you get put stuck, pushed into that role? Did you just raise your hand or that's you a, took – yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So – yeah, funny story about my background, right? I went to college for music, so my degree is in music. Interesting. And uh, and this pre-IPO startup was uh, it was my day job at the time, and so I was writing, arranging, producing music, uh, living in LA, and uh, and this this opportunity was um, it was my day job where I so uh, I'm a closet data junkie. Um, I had my first coding class when I was eight. So, I was, you know, I was a pretty nerdy kid. I was coding and, and trading stocks when I was, you know, before I turned 10. Oh, yeah. And then uh, so what happened was um, I was looking for, you know, basically day gigs while I was working in music. And um, so I went to this one company and they, they contracted me to move their database onto Oracle. Oracle was fairly new at the time, but, and, you know, but still a behemoth. It was, you know. It was the big player at the time. And so I took a contract building their database out in Oracle. And then at the end of that contract, the CEO came to me and said, hey, well, now we want to launch our first ever marketing program. And you're the only one here who knows the data. Do you want to stay on? <laughs> yeah. That's and then, cool. Uh, yeah. And yeah. then I did take some marketing classes you know, and uh, and from there, I, I was mostly self-taught. I just I just took it and ran with it. So I was running the trade show program. I was running the print ad campaigns. At the time, there was direct mail, B two B direct mail. So I was running that program. Um, I, you know, built the call center, hired and trained, and and I actually built the first CRM before there was before there was such thing as CRMs. I built the CRM for the call center. Um, so I wore really literally all of the marketing hats while I was there. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It was and you're data driven. I, I'm just curious. Was there any skills that were transferable from your music mm. to business? And because I've heard this before because music yes. is about patterns, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So funny you bring that up because there is an absolute correlation between music and data. I, I know a lot of, data junkies that are that are either uh music musically inclined or music aficionados or you know big fans and vice versa i know a lot of musicians that also have that that aptitude for big data there there's absolutely a correlation yeah well let's i mean it's just math at the end of the day right it's just math at the end of the day <laughs> yeah. isn't it yeah yeah, so and and I can share a funny – if you want to take three minutes, I'll share a funny story with you. Absolutely. So, yeah, so from that experience and on assignment, I, when I left there, I had that kind of now what? Like what am I going to do next thing post-IPO? 
And, uh, and what I realized is that, okay, I started looking for jobs, right? And all the marketing jobs, the companies wanted to pigeonhole me into a thing. They're like, oh, you got trade show experience. You can be our trade show guy. Or you got, oh, you got, you Let's know, just, right? don't ever get stuck into that, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I, I said, screw that. I'm going to go out on my own and, and just take the, all the experience that I have from this IPO run and start consulting. So I did that, right? So I moved to the Bay Area. Uh, I was consulting for 20 years, um, mostly in the financial industry. So I was able to kind of marry up my marketing and finance backgrounds. Um, and so, but the, the funny piece of that story is, uh, you know, I'm kind of a big Nine Inch Nails fan. You know, whatever. Say what you want about it. I, I love Trent Reznor's production values and, and the intensity but the funny piece of that story is uh, there's so many coders I know from my career who wear headphones and have music cranking while they're coding. It's like it's like a left brain, right brain thing where the 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 noise helps them focus on the coding. And so I had a really funny experience around it was like 2003, 2004 in the Bay where I went to a Nine Inch Nails show. And it was like this bizarre scene of like, you've got people that are like goth head from tail. They got piercings and tattoos and they're wearing all black and they have black makeup and platform shoes. And then you, you also, because it was in the Bay Area, right? We had people coming to the show that were in like suits and ties. Like they just came in from work and they're, they're uh, Silicon Valley people that want to see Nine Inch Nails. But the funniest thing I saw was there were guys in the audience that brought their laptops and were coding during the show. And I'm like, I applaud that. Because for them, it was like, normally I've got it on in my headphones. Today, it just ha they just happen to be on stage, right? And I'm just, and I'm just doing my job. Right? Yeah. I just Have thought that was, ever, it was such like, a funny scene. If somebody ever, uh, interviewer ever asked Nine Inch Nails, Trent, Resner and those guys like this, like, hey man, some of your audience are sitting there with laptops coding. Are they stealing your music or what are they doing, man? <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. It's cool. Yeah, so, uh, funny stuff. fast forward to when you started launching this uh, company sure. called GrowStack, which was we acquire, operate, and grow cash flow companies as a software as a service. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and there was kind of an intermediate step there as well, where I started, uh, while I was consulting, I started a company called Noisy Planet, which yeah. was uh, virtual management for uh, unsigned artists and musicians. Uh -huh. um, and so it was effectively my, it was like my own founder's view or introduction to, to SaaS. Was, and, it a, was it more like a marketplace? No, it was really back office. Like we were, what the, the message we were telling our, our unsigned artists is this is like a virtual management platform. So like if you need t-shirts for your next show, call us. If you need a street team to help promote the show, call us. If you need, you know, whatever you need for, if you need contract review, right? We have yeah. music attorneys that we can connect you with. Like whatever you need that you would normally get from a label, do it with us instead, Right. And yeah. everything was just, it was like all pay as you go for um, services. Did you do it to make money or to get access to up and coming artists? And, yeah, uh, it was. Or both, yeah. Yeah, it was both. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a way for me to kind of merge my music and, and marketing backgrounds, right? So. Yeah. And we, we had a really good run until uh, the, the bottom, well, until uh, everything went streaming, the bottom fell out of monetization for music, oh. right? And then the next phase of that decline was that, um, you know, it, there was the shift from uh, single song purchases and downloads to streaming yep. and, uh, and then a decline in revenue for the artists. And so then the only artists that were making money were artists who played live and then COVID hit. And then suddenly nobody was playing live. Right. So they're like, yeah. oh, okay, so I'm getting 0. 0.0001 cents per spin and I can't play a live show because of pandemic. Yeah. So independent artists were screwed for a, a number of years there. And so, um, so noisy planet kind of fell by the wayside during that period. And, uh, we're actually just working on bringing it back now. I've got a new CEO I'm hiring. Yeah. We are going to, any, any that artists plan, that, but... uh, we're up and coming or not signed that, made it big that you 
Uh, not so well? much. I mean, there we did have artists that uh, that did get major label contracts, but you know, for for any of your listeners who know the music industry, like even getting a major label deal doesn't. <laughs> it's not the end all. It's like another starting line where. It's like, you know, the artists celebrate like, hey, I, you know, I could, I've always dreamed of being on a major label. And then they get there and they're like, oh, this kind of sucks because now they own they own my life, everything in my life. And uh, and uh, I got to pay back the the uh, front money through future royalties. And yeah. they now have artistic direction over my career. And, th- and this is this is the common the common description. Right. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, where, uh, you know, the the there is a certain level of artists who can go to the majors and call their shots, but most, most can't. Mostly no. Yeah. yeah. And, and in fact, I know there were a number of noisy planet artists who even got to the point where they got the major label deal and they, they recorded their first album under contract with that label. The, uh, they printed up, you know, whatever, a hundred thousand, 500,000 million copies at the time, you know, CDs, right. They printed the material and then the label decided not to promote them so that all their stuff is sitting in a warehouse and they can't get out of the contract. So they're on a major label deal. They recorded an album. It's ready to go. And then the label won't release them. Yeah. Do they still require ownership of the rights of the songs or are they, they moved away from that? Uh, it really depends on the artist. So um, Mostly, though, they're doing what they call wraparound deals, which are really intrusive. Like, they technically own a piece of anything you get. So, like, somebody buys you a birthday present, technically speaking, they own, they own like, a percentage of that. Jesus. Right? Yeah. And, but the idea is, I mean, on the flip side of it, I, I, I'm kind of going dark on, on the labels, which we probably always should. But, but on the flip side, from the label perspective... Um, what they're looking for is, hey, this this artist might actually sell more uh, shirts than music, or they might sell more cologne than music or perfume than music, right? So we just want a piece of whatever they're able to successfully sell under their brand. So they, the, the contracts shifted from focusing on music to focusing on uh, merch as a brand. Yeah, yeah merch. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's like, uh, what's her name, that uh, singer just recently. I mean, from her concerts, did a billion dollars in sales from yeah. the merch. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then a lot of even like big artists, like, you know, you think like Katy Perry, people at the Katy, Katy Perry level of success are saying, I'm not going to play as many shows anymore because most of them aren't profitable. But I, all the other stuff I sell is great. Right? Yeah. Like I can't make money going out and filling a stadium anymore, but there are 10 other ways I can, I can turn a buck. Yeah. And it's a lot yeah. of energy to do a show. It is like a that. lot of energy. Yeah. 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 Yep. I, I guess. So I, anyway, did... that was kind of a tangent into the. Yeah. yeah no, no. I love that stuff. <laughs> I used to go to a lot of concerts. I was more of a rock guy. I mean, not the nice. nine inch nails stuff. That's the nineties. I was more like the eighties rock guy. Yeah, very cool. Very yeah. cool. The ACDC. Okay. Motley Crue. And there you D- go. Yeah. I got myself yeah. to the US Festival. Wow, well done. Yeah. <laughs> that was crazy. Those were the and days. It, yeah, the 80s those, were amazing. The 80s yeah. were, I don't know. You could argue that the 80s were one of the best eras ever for music. Uh, I, for rock and roll, I feel like, a, you know, ACDC or Van Halen or Motley Crue. Yes, I would agree. So. Yeah. 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 Any. So how did you get, uh, let's uh, talk about this uh, yes. uh, growth My, stack. You know, transition into like, SaaS, hey, yeah. I'm going to start acquiring companies. Like, What was the thought process to go to get there and just buy a company? Yeah, so what happened was, uh, as I mentioned, I was consulting for about 20 years, and I had a great run. I mean, I was working for a lot of Fortune 500 brands that you would recognize and, uh, and working on really – you know, high budget, interesting projects with super smart people around me all the time. So that was great. And then one day I was actually at a meeting uh, in a big conference room with one of my clients and I looked around the room and it hit me <laughs> that when I started my consulting career, I was usually the youngest guy in the room. And I had this epiphany one day where I looked around and I was like, this, I'm not the youngest guy in the room anymore. <laughs> and I'm still technically, as a consultant, I'm still technically an hourly worker. Like if something happens to me and I can't show up for a day or a week or a year. They cut you like that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. 
And so I'm like, I need to look for something else. Like I need another, there needs to be another phase of my career. And I'd rather make that, that switch while I'm at the top of my game. Right. It's kind of the, it's almost like a, you know, quarterback mentality, right? Like I want to go out when I'm at the top, not when uh, people start whispering like, Hey, who's that guy over there in that queue? But he was asleep. And they'd be like, Oh yeah, that's Kevin. He's super smart, but only wake him up if it's really important. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's i was kind of seeing that vision of my future and i was like i can't i can't do that so uh so i started actively looking for you know what would become the next phase of my career and what i discovered is that there is a thriving secondary market for online businesses i mean there's a whole community it's pretty it's robust but it's also tight-knit everybody kind of knows everybody um there's only a handful of uh you know there's founders and brokers and investors and whatever at every level of play. And so once I discovered this, you know, kind of community or culture, I just, I fell in love with it. I was like, this is cool. Like, and, and the way I describe it to people, cause even now I've got family members who don't really understand what I do. Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, I mean, I hear my mom who's in her eighties, like at a holiday party, I'll hear her whisper to somebody like, Oh yeah, that's that's my son Kevin, and he's really good with computers. And I'm like, that, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's that doesn't a broad, mean anything. It's right? a broad general statement. Yes, yes, it is. I'm good yeah. with computers. That's what she's got out of this. So, and nothing against her, but the the point really is not about her. It's about the fact that it's it. Um, I recognized early on that uh, it's a space that people aren't. They just don't have a lot of awareness of. So the way I describe this to people is, hey, if Apple buys Beats for a billion dollars, people know about it. They hear about it. It's in the news. People, There's a buzz, right? People are excited to talk about it. They're like, hey, did you hear Apple's buying Beats for a billion dollars? Mm-hmm. Right? Um, so I'm doing the same thing just on a level where nobody cares. Like if I pay a million or five million or even $50 million for a company, it's not going to make any headlines. Nobody cares. And there's this thriving marketplace for businesses that are, you know, micro market, lower market, middle market, where again, like most of the companies, most, some will, but most will not become household names or brand names. You might read about some in TechCrunch or Crunchbase, but generally speaking, the the public is not going to be aware of those transactions or those companies, maybe ever. It's all niched. I mean, it's, it's all they, they tapped yeah, out right. at, let's say, $5 million in revenue, and that's all. No matter how much marketing you put into it, they're probably going to be tapped out. Right. Yeah. Yeah, more or less. I mean, the reason the marketplace exists is because, let's say there's 20 to 70% growth left in that brand, right? To your point, like, let's say they're at $5 million, and you can take them to $7 million or ten, even $10 million. Yeah. VCs don't care about that. <laughs> they're not, right? They're not going to make any wow, money. Wow, you it. doubled yeah, it they're... from five million to ten million. It's like gold star. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> like they, they actually care. try to get out of that 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 company out of their portfolio. I mean, it's yes. great, but let's move out of it because yes. there's no return on it. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, uh, so this marketplace exists, and it and it exists in a meaningful way. Um. Because it is micro market or lower market, I think there is, you know, inherently more risk in those deals. Like the path to zero is a lot shorter than it is with something that a VC would invest in. Yeah. Right? Maybe. I don't know. As I'm saying that, I'm like, is that even right? Because, I mean, statistically speaking, VCs get it right, like, you know, one out of 20 times. Well, statistically, most nine SMBs, 93%. Uh, you know, never, don't do one million dollars, right. and the the chances are very small they'll ever make it to five. That's right. Yeah, or yeah. they're out of business in five years. Yes. Yeah. And VCs do throw money at stuff that's pre-revenue on the hopes that they got it right, but you know, Big sometimes markets, they do, and sometimes billion-dollar markets, yes. unicorns. Yeah. Yes. So what exactly. what did the market look like ten years ago for SaaS companies? And I mean, did you just go to these larger, uh, you know, broker sites that were that were around ten years ago? Or yeah, or- exactly. I started out with um, 
you know, marketplaces and brokers. Yes. Yeah. And at the time I was doing, like, I, I was willing to invest in my education. So I was buying really micro stuff, like think, you know, 10,000 to 50,000 just to look under the hood and see if I could run it and see if yeah. I could make money. Like I wanted to understand how the money flowed and what was required. The name of the game in any online business is traffic and conversions, right? Traffic you got to drive traffic and you got to convert it into money. Right. Yeah. And then there's other stuff that happens after like stickiness and churn. Like you don't want your customers to churn. You got to onboard customers faster than they quit. Right. And especially if you're, if your audience is SMBs, uh, that your, your, um, customer base is going to be pretty dynamic. Right. Yeah. Well, how, how so, many, can you translate that to a number of companies and how much you spent to, to get your education, you know, swings yeah. at the at pitches? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I would say in the first year to two years, I would say, let's just say it this way in the first 24 months after I proclaimed that I was not going to take any more consulting gigs. And I, I had to say it out loud. I had to tell my clients like, no, I'm not, not doing this anymore. Right. I'm, a, I'm the oldest guy in the meeting room. So no, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> I'm out. That's right. And I, you know, they offered me jobs and whatever. And I was like, no, no, thank you. Yeah. Um, Did you almost ever turn back? Like, Oh my God. You should do it. Yeah. Mm, uh, okay. So honestly, maybe one day a year for the last, it's, this is my nine year anniversary right now since I, I switched gears Yeah. and maybe once per year I have a day where I'm like, man, I, I'll tell you what drives that is I'll see a friend of mine. who's like, Oh, I've been at the same company for 12 years and I'm, you know, I'm going on a big vacation. <laughs> I'm like, Hmm. There's a, so this this is something I know you can relate to, which is the myth of um, freedom and entrepreneurship. Like people say to me all the time, like, "Oh, it must be so nice." Like you 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 know you run this show and you call all the shots and you make your own schedule, and you can work from anywhere in the world. And all of that is true and false at the same time, right? Like yes. I work a lot of hours. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I whatever you think of Elon Musk, I saw an interview with Joe Rogan, and, and he just goes. You know, the way he answers questions goes, you know, it's hard. It's hard to run a company. And he goes, well, you're running like five. And he goes, yeah, and I have a cot in my, <laughs> in my office. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so I do enjoy that ability to work from anywhere in the world anytime. But, um, but it's a double-edged sword because I am running global companies with global clients. And so I'm a – I. Like me personally, I'm a 24 hour operation. Sometimes I'm working at one in the afternoon and sometimes one in the morning. Yeah. And it's all the same to me. I don't care. You know, I'll talk to anybody in there, anywhere in the world, anytime, pretty much. Yeah. So, so, uh, I mean, I, when I am enjoying it, I really enjoy it. Right. Like when I turn off for a few hours here and there and I'm like, you know, I mean like today I'm working from Lake Tahoe. It doesn't suck. That doesn't suck. <laughs> Is there still snow in Lake Tahoe? Uh, at the higher elevations, yeah. Although yeah, the okay. mountains are still snow capped, but it's mostly melted now. Yeah. But yeah, so it's when it's good, it's really good. And there are times where it's there are to your point, like there are times when I'm like, Man, I could just take a job. Yeah. But then every time I play that through in my head, I'm like, No, I can't. No, right? Because yeah. yeah. over the years, like while I was consulting, all but one of my consulting clients offered me a full time job. They're like, Hey, you're a great consultant, why don't you switch? And I said and I always told them, I'm like I might be the best consultant you've ever had. I would be the worst employee you've ever had. Like day one, like if you take away the the incentive for me to do a good job as a consultant, then I have no incentive at all. Like first day, I'm going to show up in a robe and fuzzy slippers around 10.30 a.m. And I'm going to be talking about where I'm going for lunch all day. I'm not going to team building exercises or team meetings. I'm not doing the annual goal setting to get my 3% bump. <laughs> Don't care. Yeah, that's a that's right. a, a dichotomy between the W two and the consultant or the entrepreneur. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm like, the, and the reason you wanted me as a consultant is because I have a broad base to draw from, right? In terms of yeah. experience and skills, like I've seen it all. I've I've helped you know 300 companies grow or launch stuff. Traffic and that's conversions. What, that's why I'm yeah. here. Traffic and conversions. Yep. Yeah. So. <clears throat> You want to shortcut the process of selling your business? 
Did you know over 80% of listed businesses never sell, but you don't have to be one of them? The Magnolia Firm Rapid Acquisition Club removes the most time-consuming stages of selling by featuring your company directly to live qualified buyers, where you will have the opportunity to receive an offer immediately, live. This is perfect for sellers who want a quick and low-hassle acquisition. And I've asked them to waive the $2,500 fee. If you mentioned you saw this on my podcast, to be featured in the Rapid Acquisition Club and sell your business fast, click on the link below. Yeah, so then, yeah, so I discovered this thriving secondary marketplace for online businesses and I, I jumped in. So yeah, the first 24 months, you'd ask me that question, so I'm gonna answer that one directly. First 24 months, I probably bought 12 businesses, maybe 12 businesses. 15. And they're all what, sub 100,000? Tiny. tiny. Yeah, Tiny. at that time they were all yeah they were all in the ten thousand one hundred thousand. Ten thousand, okay. So that that's yeah. your education, your MBA, right there. It's just like yep, it is. Yeah, and I learned some important things. <laughs> like there was this one business I bought. But this is this is horrible. I, I hate. I almost hate telling this story because it hurts every time. But there was one business that I bought for sixty thousand. And sixty thousand cash or uh, yeah, sixty thousand yeah. cash took over yeah. the whole thing. And it was a great business. And then like 90 days later, I'm at a conference, at a bar, and this guy's like, hey, what are you up to? And I'm telling him. And then he's like, well, what do you own? And I told him. And he's like, I love that business. He's like, I've been using that business for years. I'm like, oh, awesome. You know, thank you for being a customer. Later that night, I'm going back to my hotel room, and he sends me a text. He texted me an offer to buy it. So I paid sixty, and he was willing to pay one hundred and twenty, and I turned him down, <laughs> which is stupid. Uh, God, well, I can see what's coming, right? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, because at the time I was like, oh man, like I'm only, I've only been running it for ninety days. This guy's offering me one hundred percent return. Like, it must be worth even more. Like I, I just started. Like once I put, I go all in on this, right? Uh, Maybe I can sell it for three x or five x. Everybody thinks that. Yeah. Right. If somebody offers yeah. me one hundred twenty thousand, there's probably somebody out there who's going to offer me three hundred sixty thousand at some right. point. Yeah. Yeah. But in hindsight, anytime anybody offers you a hundred percent gain in ninety days on something, take it. Take Just it. take it. So is that your rule now? <laughs> is that your rule yes. now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Everything's for sale. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard i get it and especially for founders like in that case i wasn't the founder i was a buyer so i bought yeah. it and i uh, assigned my team to it and we had growth plans and a roadmap and we're, like we're executing and uh and seeing growth and feeling really good about it so uh but but i wasn't the founder so at, for a founder you even have a deeper emotional connection to that that Asset yeah, you that put brand. more than you know fifty hours a week in that. You're, yeah, it's yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's hard. It's hard to it's hard to say. It's oddly hard for founders to say yes to exits. And that's a yeah. that's a whole nother ball of wax. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just the psychology and the, the emotional to, to, attachment to, to, to our get businesses. What it, what it, what it's worth? I go well. You know, it took me 120 hours a week for yep. three years to get this off the ground. Yes. So, what's that worth? Like, if you sat in front yeah. of Shark Tank, they would just go, "Well, that's your skin in the game." Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, taking that full circle. So uh, in the last nine years. I've just been stair-stepping the marketplace. So I started out with these really micro deals and then eventually we we're doing six figure deals and then eventually our first seven figure deals. And then now we're working on our first eight figure deals. Yeah. Well, I'm not well, sure if we're going to get into the nine figure acquisition territory, just cause there's a, there's kind of a soft spot in the marketplace for lower market SaaS, where the deals are out of reach for most solopreneurs. And uh, they're flying under the radar of most PEs and VCs. So there is a yeah. soft spot there where companies are producing, let's say, two to ten million EBITDA. There and again, like growing at twenty to even forty percent annually. Um, VCs and, PC, and PEs aren't going to care about them until they get right. to you know hundred million ARR. Right, right. Uh, but now you have a lot more competitors like 
tiny company um those guys and there's a couple others out there doing the same thing now yeah there's a handful but even then like i have invest investors ask me that question like hey well tell me about the competition and like is it going to be hard for you to get to source these deals and get them done and my answer is well it's surprisingly rare that like I and another firm like Tiny would be in market and liquid and chasing the same target at the same time. At the same time. Right. Yeah. Like we might need, we might be as close as a few weeks apart on something, but but the odds of us both submitting LOIs in the same like 30 day time period. That is, would signify a pretty rare. small market if that was the case. Yeah. Yeah, and it kind of is. It kind of is. And the reason is it goes back to what we were just talking about, founders, right? So founders go through very I, – I feel like I don't need to tell you this but, or your audience, right? Like founders go through a progression where um, at first it's exciting. They want to take it to market. They want to see if it's a customer billion dollar will pay a dollar for their widget. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then they're in market and then it's kind of like, okay, now it's harder than we thought and there's – 17 different things that we have to get done today to succeed. And then they got to start prioritizing. And then, uh, and then if they are successful in those early stages um, and cash starts coming in, then their, their, their emotional attachment to that business evolves. So one thing that happens, and I think this is especially oh, true. It's finally SAS. worked. <laughs> right. Yes. So, you know, five like, years oh. later, <laughs> Right. five years later, exactly. And then at that point you're like, Oh, I got an offer. The offer sounds fair, but the truth is now I'm at the point where the cash is flowing. I'm working 20 to 40 hours a week, depending on the week. Like if they, at some point, if depending on the founder, but most, most founders who get to that level are going to start treating it like a lifestyle business, not a future venture. That's correct. Right. And yeah. The guys that I know, like there's uh, one founder that I that I consider a friend and a colleague. I've watched his progression over the last nine years. Maybe he's going on ten years now, and he is he and his partner bootstrapped to 100 million ARR, <laughs> never taken a dime of outside capital. Yeah, that's amazing. And yeah, and I interviewed him for uh, for my mastermind, and the one takeaway I got from him is, I mean, and he is not kidding when he says this and you can see it, you can like see it in his body language and hear it in his voice. Right. He's like every day I wake up as though it's the first day we've ever been in business. Like he has that founder day one founder mentality every single day. Yeah. So every day is about how do we, how do we get a, you know, 30 basis points lift out of that one channel? Or how do we improve efficiency such that we get a you know fifty basis points lift in net income or whatever? Yeah. Right? He's always thinking about how do we take what we've got and make it a little bit better today. And I applaud that because most founders, at some point, there's a curve, right? <laughs> there's a curve. Yeah, where, it's a, <laughs> I, that's a, like an almost an exception because to keep maintain that passion over. I don't know how many years is, um, but if you turn it into a lifestyle business where it's like, you know, you're living your life personally and professionally at the same time and you're satisfied, you don't need more. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so then the, the next phase is, uh, when a business starts to become that person's identity, right? Like we, there are founders that I've been negotiating exits with for, you know, more than two years. Wow. And they can't get to the finish line because every time they get close, like we, we submit an offer, they accept it. We go through diligence, you know, we're getting financing in place. Like the cap stack is ready. Everybody's ready. And they're like, Oh no, we're not doing it. Right. Yeah. And the reason is they can't imagine what they're going to do next. Like they can't imagine, okay, what happens? Like I've been running this business for, you know, five years or eight years or 12 years. Right. They can't imagine what life will be like once they exit. So, um, so then they start questioning, you know, multiple, they're like, well, you know, you're giving me six years up front or seven years up front. I mean, that's how you have to think about multiples, right? On valuation is how many years are you advancing that found the exiting founder 
in cash. The, I don't know if somebody's whispering in their ears. The likelihood of you to strike riches twice is very, very small. Like right. to start a second company and it becomes successful and it gets sold. Yeah. It's even smaller than the first doing it once. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it's hard for, for most founders that you hit, a, a, especially if, if they started treating their business like a lifestyle business and there's a point at which um, they just, they just can't let go of it. So anyway, bringing, just bringing that back, you know, the, that to me, that is the why behind why it's kind of a small and tight marketplace. Yeah. Is because you've got to catch the right person at the right time, right? Where something is going on and they're like, yeah, I do want to exit this. Now, and, what are you seeing? And there's, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what are you seeing about the SaaS founders versus like an SMB selling an HVAC business? You know, they tap out, they're retiring SaaS and they say the three D's. Uh, divorce, death, or disinterested in an SMB HVAC business. SaaS business, what is it? They could still be 35 years old, right? You know, and, that is right. Yeah. Yeah. So the number one reason given on any prospectus for SaaS, or for the number one reason for exit is uh, I have other projects and this will fund my next venture, right? I have other um, projects. Yeah. That's not usually that's not the driving force. It, that's what they'll say. Oh, like seven out of 10, that's what they'll tell you. But usually there is something else going on, right? Like, uh, and sometimes it is, you know, death and divorce, but more often than not, it's, it's something, it's some other life event that's driving it. Yeah. And, and do you have a conversation with them to kind of, find out a little bit more about them personally to find out what that is. And I mean, it, yes, if you're, you know, looking at prospects over a two year period and you contact them every three or six months, it, it sounds like you're having these personal conversations. You get to know them with the relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's one deal we're working on today. In fact, where I've known the founders for about seven years. Wow. Um, and their brothers, can't give away too much on this call, but, uh, uh, you know, we, I made them an offer five years ago. I made them another offer right before pandemic. And then what happened is this year they came to me and said, Hey, we're finally ready to sell this business. And we're calling you first because we've been talking about it for years. You know, yeah. the business, you know, the model, like I know they're finding, I knew their financials before they sent them over. Like I, you know, most most of the biz most of the founders I meet with, like on a seller call, I have a pretty good idea of their revenue and their net and their churn before they yeah even, they already turned over yeah. their docs to you before. Uh, I mean, I, you know, what I'm saying is even before I, even before I see the docs, I can usually guess within a pretty close margin of error just because I've looked at so many deals, right? So it's yeah. not a mystery. I look at I look at where, um, where do you start from? What do you how do you know this? What's yeah, the so I was just going to yeah. say, yeah, a lot of it is just look at the marketplace and competitor analysis. Um, you know, we can research things like, you know, have they, you know, have they raised before or not? You know, they made it to a Series A. Do they have multiple series that they've already funded? You know, what stage are they at? Or is it bootstrapped? Is it friends and family, seed money? Is it, you know, have they gone through some actual formal series of, of fundraising? Um, and if they, there's signals there. I mean, they may yes. get their, their their founder money, then their Series A. If they don't get the Series A, that's a signal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and then just to share with you my criteria. So uh, as it turns out, what I've learned from, from my own experience buying, you know, a bunch of businesses that are very different from one another, um, the criteria that's most important to me now is um, bootstrap because then we can make a play on it without having intermediaries evolved or, you know, the VC board of directors uh, calling any shots. Um, so bootstrapped and uh, high barrier to entry. So I, I have become vertical agnostic, but what, I, what I'm attracted to now are founders and technology, you know, models that are deep right? The, like the founder is exceptional. They've got a 
core knowledge that very few people on the planet have. Right. Or these founders have brought to market something that has a really deep model. Like it'd be hard for somebody in Croatia to wake up tomorrow and compete. And copy. Right. Which, yeah. yeah. Which happens in like MarTech. I learned the hard way that MarTech and AdTech, that happens. Like as soon as a new business has traction with a new model, there's cheap knockoffs around the world. Oh, yeah. Weeks. Who were those two guys from Germany that were doing that for for all the big apps, you know? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And they uh, can afford to take something to market for like, you know, less than $100,000. Jeez. It's like, charge. really? You guys already did the business model. We're just going to re-engineer <laughs> it. It's pretty easy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to offer 40% of the features that you offer, but we're going to charge 10% of the cost. Right. Yeah. So they're really focused on let's get the lower end of the marketplace where we're going to offer something for $9 instead of $99 or whatever. Right. And, and it works. And that's, so by the way, for anyone listening, that's a great model if you want to do it. Um, but, but my, yeah, go ahead. But now that you have your criteria, it's been refined over the years. You have the luxury of time going, oh, okay, we have better success. We have better profits we have everything looks better if it's bootstrap but originally you were starting you know looking at companies that were vc funded uh and and there was still vc shares and you had to go negotiate with a vc and sometimes i've had this experience where uh, i was looking at a company and the the founder had to buy the shares back from the vc and i've also seen it where the vc just wrote it off right yeah that is right yeah. What 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 did you have any of those experiences yourself or? Yeah, there is. You... So I am still interested in uh, dead weight on VCs portfolios, but yeah. I'm not going to go through the founder for that. Like if we're talking to a VC and we're like, "Hey, show us your SaaS that's dragging on your portfolio that you don't care about anymore." Yeah. Right, and we'll look at those. But that's um, just one avenue of potential prospects how long yes. do you think that deal sourcing takes works uh it takes time i think well and that's kind of why i um favor bootstrap founders yeah because boot for bootstrap founders like i've been i have been a bootstrap founder <laughs> i know what that's like and so i can meet somebody where they're at pretty pretty quickly where i I can have that conversation, whether it's just a cold call or meeting somebody at a conference or I'm introduced by a developer or something, right? Or somebody joins the mastermind or they know somebody in the mastermind knows somebody, right? I can, in in minutes, I can make a connection with the bootstrap founder and get it and have a pretty good understanding of where they're at in their in their life cycle and, uh, and what their motivations might be. Yeah. Uh, it... it is it different negotiating with a bootstrap founder than it is with somebody that's taking, uh, you know, money from a VC? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. The thing is with a bootstrap founder, you can get, you have a lot more flexibility. So the why behind, you know, why did they start the business? Why are they even thinking about exiting? Um, those become really important, right? Like the, their, their life connection to that business becomes important such that you can create, you can craft an offer that is super flexible and hits on their why. Like their why might be like, Hey, you know what? Like I'm not seeing my kids enough. And I just had a third, I got a newborn at home, my third kid. Right. Yeah. And it's just not, I can't do 60 to hundred hours anymore, but I would still work for you for, 20 hours a week and consult and share with you the, you know, like manage the roadmap product roadmap while you do all your, you know, sales and marketing stuff. Do, um, do you offer that or do they, for, you know, offer that you, you just like, Hey, you know, I don't see my kids much. That's the complaint. You've got to provide the solution. Yeah. So that's, that's exactly it. So I'll learn to your earlier point. Like I learn what's what's really driving their motivations to be yeah. in the business or not in the business, and then I craft an offer that matches. Where I can go to the I can get like with a bootstrap founder, you can get super creative, 
because they're not necessarily thinking about like 10 year IRR. Like with the VC, you've got a team of analysts that are looking at, you know, 10 or 20 year IRR projections. Right? So, and they're like, they're, it's a, it's a formula, <laughs> but with the bootstrap founder, you can say like, Hey, what if, you know, you could work from home in the Bahamas while running this business part time. And we take these things off your plate that you have always hated anyway. And we do that. Yeah. And you can just focus on X and, and you retain some equity for doing that. How does that sound? And then, uh, and you can also get creative on, um, terms, right? So the, the adage in our mastermind is, you know, it's never the price. It's always the terms. You can, you can offer just about any valuation, but what matters at the end of the day is, well, what are the terms? And the terms have to make sense for both parties. So some, some bootstrap founders are going to want more cash up front. Some are going to want less up front. Some are going to really appreciate having some retained equity and getting a second bite. Yeah. Um, some are going to want to work a lot of hours. Some are going to want to work zero hours, right? Like all these things, there are a lot of levers that you can pull to satisfy, you know, their motivations for transferring controlling interest while still managing risk on our side of the table. Yeah. So this sounds like a, a much more patient game. Did, did you always have this skill of patience or you had to learn it mm. more and more over the time to. Yeah, that's a great question. So I would, I think, and I, it's funny. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that, but, it, but I think it's, I learned it from my consulting career because if you're working as a consultant for a fortune 500 company, you've got a lot of chefs in the kitchen on any project. And there were times where I was working on, you know, nine with, with nine figure budgets. And so, and in the financial industry, there's like, there's players touching the project from every angle. You got legal and compliance and accounting and, you know, finance and, you got to show the models and, and I can't tell you how many times I had, but where I was hired to take a product or a service to market and it was big budget, high visibility in the organization. And then like after months or even a year of work on it with the project team, somebody at the senior executive level scrapped it at the last minute. Like, Hey, we're going to go to launch. Like, this is our launch. This is a rollout plan. Like, you know, October one, you're going to be in market. And then they're like, now nah, we're not doing that anymore. Different direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different direction, exactly. So uh, that thanks for your you. thanks for your time and effort. Different. We're heading a different uh, direction. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that that is something that will teach you patience because as a consultant, like uh, you know, I hate to I hate to undervalue it, but like I kind of don't care. Like they hired me for a job and I did my job. So whether they launch it or not has no bearing on my life. I'm, right. a, I'm a so you contract didn't have, worker. Create the emotional attachment to the outcome, which would create its suffering, let's say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But then the like the full time employees I'm working with, it does matter to them because they're people who are like like it's not that different from founder mentality, right? They're like, Oh man, like I have put my lifeblood into this project for a year and now you're killing the project. Like for them yeah. it's impactful. And yeah, then they we're, start we're thinking not things like, in Am it, I gonna right? get laid off? And uh, is there going to be another project? And if I, if not this one, what about, you know, and they, they get really upset. Um, so as a consultant, I guess that's, I guess that's how I learned that is like, well, there's always another project and uh, you know, you're just, you're always focused on what you can control and you do the best with the data that you've got every day. That's pretty yeah. much it. Do so. you on deal sourcing now, is it all off market and relationships or do you, you know, see something on FE International or some of the bigger ones and say, hey, that looks like a good deal. It's a reasonable price. Let's go check it out. Yeah. So I really don't care where a deal comes from. Okay. But, um, but you know, those that we source off market, again, we've just got a lot more room to negotiate. Like if, we, if there's no broker in between, whispering in the, the seller's ear, the broker's yeah. got to get paid. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So and the broker is less likely to get creative on terms too. Like, you know, 
I mean, I'll just give one example. Like something I've done in the past is, you know, we'll we'll say, okay, it's X amount of cash up front. You got X X percent rollover equity, and then there's this other piece that's that you'll get at month X based on performance, right? Yeah. Um, so it's it's different from seller financing, but there's still a component where you're deleveraging risk and motivating the seller to continue consulting and, and, you know, right. focusing on growth. So, and brokers, they almost can't do it because, and I, I've tried that with brokers and then what they tell me is, Oh, well, I want my full commission up front as though they hit that target and you're paying out the full amount. I'm like, well, that's not really fair to me. <laughs> right. They don't, they don't care. <laughs> Next. They don't care. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're like, you just pay, if you pay the, like the seller will agree to your terms, but we will only do it if you pay our full commission right now. Up front. Yeah, up yeah. front. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's more restrictive. Yeah. It's not impossible. Not impossible. I've just we've heard it. They go, hey man, as long as you pay my commission, I don't care how you work out this creative deal, right? Yes. The, so let me ask you, your cap stack and where you get your money to buy the companies now. Now you, uh, I, I'm taking. I see that you paid it out of your pocket for these smaller deals. Now you get larger. How did you finance these deals? Yeah. So uh, early on, it was all friends and family, right? So people saw what I was doing and they were excited about it. And they're like, "Hey, man! Like, I don't know SaaS and I don't know what you're doing, but I I see that you're excited and making money. So what if I gave you money and then you invest it for me?" And, uh, and then I just get dividends off of that. So that's what I did early on. I built uh, micro portfolios uh, with the GPLP structure. Gotcha. Was there then some what happened kind of, was, yeah, go ahead. Was there some kind of uh, uh, subscription? It was his friends and family. Did you need a subscription agreement? Just curious. And it, was yeah, there any like, hey, there's an exit. There's a multiple uninvested capital you get after five, seven years. Yeah, so we had a subscription agreement in the GPLP portfolios. Okay. You know, paid out gotcha. dividends. Yeah. And then what happened was, you know, we've just been going up market, you know, and so I hit a critical point where it didn't make any sense to reach out to any friends and family and say, hey, you know, we need, you know, how soon can you wire $3 million or 5 or 10 <laughs> or 80 <laughs> right? This, how many people do you did you have 20 years in consulting business nine figure but jobs like yeah you probably have a lot more in your uh, you know network than i do that could do that yeah yeah so uh and then the once you go up market like once you're talking to family office analysts and pe's and you know institutional capital they've totally frowned on my GPLP micro portfolios. They're like, you're going to spend, like you're asking me to, to wire $10 million while you're still kind of part-time running this other portfolio. That's got a AUM of 1.2. Like I'm 10 X bigger than your, than that portfolio. So this is a distraction. Yeah. Right. This is a distraction. Yes. Right? Yes. Doesn't move the needle. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yep. And so, uh, and I'll be honest, like just full transparency, I'm still at kind of a crossroad where now we're working eight figure deals. I've got some legacy early micro investors that are like, what's going on with the 15 K I put in? <laughs> I'm like, like in one call, I'm negotiating terms on like literally you know, 35, $40 million. And on the next call, I'm taking a call from somebody who's like, Hey, I, you know, my checking in on the investment I made three K. years ago. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so uh, it's hard. Well, that was a rule, rule, them... rule number three was, uh, you don't call me. <laughs> right. Yeah. No kidding. I know. Yeah. I know. It's frustrating a little bit. Yeah. I'm just sharing that. It's, it's a little frustrating because I do owe them appropriate uh, an appropriate level of respect and attention yeah and transparency yeah but um but there's something else there's another dynamic i was talking with another founder this morning about this there's another dynamic where right now capital markets are tight um investment for 
early stage pre-revenue or pre-profit companies is gone for now. The only people that are getting funding are um, cash flowing, you know, cash flowing businesses that have growth. Put more money in their successful portfolio companies. Yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah, the, yeah, exactly. The way to say it is that um, the uh, risk profile has shifted. Right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. And now uh, people are talking about profit coins instead of unicorns. Like that's a real thing right now. Profit coin. Yeah. Mm hmm. And the other dynamic is that while the capital markets have tightened, individual investors have recently lost money in pot and crypto. And now they're scrambling to find cash. So they're calling founders where they've got five or 10 or 20 or 50,000 placed. And they're like, hey, <laughs> Like, I don't want to tell you that I just lost 300000 in crypto, but I could really use that 50000 back. For like, for <laughs> right? That's kind of what's yeah. happening. So I'm hearing from other founders that um, whereas a year ago they got almost zero calls from micro-investors, this year everybody's calling. Everybody's looking for cash. Huh. And so the dynamics have changed a bit. So um, so it is what it is. Uh for me, how does how does that favor you? Like, how can you turn that into a positive? Yeah. Mm, that's a really good question. I don't know that I have a great answer for that because, like, I mean, what I've done over the past eighteen months is I've really shifted my focus to eight-figure deals, yeah, and eight-figure funders, and I've got them. I've got the deals, and I have the investors, uh, and, and uh, so. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, well, let me give some context to that it's because, it, like, money always finds an opportunity, right? And I was, I think it was reading in a Wall Street Journal article about active investors are targeting ESG companies because they're slower moving and there's more opportunity to take over them. Sure. But it always finds a way, right? They always, yes. like, okay, where, where's the always opportunity? Does. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of cash on the sidelines right now. Yeah. So, yeah. So I've got some pretty good, you know, traction on both, uh, you know, buying and, and funding, like deal flow and funding. Um, and I just need to uh, keep my <laughs> early micro investors happy for a little bit longer so that I can offer them liquidity and say, okay, here, today's the day. Here's your offer. You can exit, but before you do, you might want to consider that we just closed on this other thing and it's doing, you know, whatever, 50 million a year and growing. And you can still participate in that. But now, now's your chance, right? You have to say <laughs> so today. Like you have 24 hours to say, yeah, I'm heading for the exit. I just want my 15K or now I'm going to stay in and see if I, if that turns into 60K in the next the years, test of right? a good marketer is to turn somebody that was looking for their money and exit and ask them to invest yeah. more. Yes. <laughs> yes. So true. Yeah. No yeah. kidding. That's yeah. great. So hey. There will be that, that offer is coming. I, I can't really say anything more about that because I'll get into legal trouble, but, um, but that's coming down the pike where uh, I'll be able to offer something for my early investors where and, it, and like and like we just said, it's just take it or leave it, right? Yeah. Um, and then just focus on uh, on lower middle market deals from here on out. Yeah, makes sense. And then go to to to, to find the money for the cap stack from the bigger check writers. Exactly. Yeah. What, yeah, and I've got commitments. It's such a funny thing. I'll just tell you, like, the first time you get. A uh, funding letter from somebody saying that they'll give you, you know, twenty five or fifty or a hundred million dollars is exciting. Nothing yeah, yeah, like. yeah. <laughs> and now I got. And a is that of is that low interest <laughs> debt or is that some equity? Yeah, uh, usually it's some combination of debt and equity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, so let, actually, let me quantify that a little more. Some of those letters are from venture debt, and some of those letters are from equity players. And and could even be family offices. So it right. just depends. And but I, I when I got my first one, man, I was like, "This is it." <laughs> it's like, well, there you go, man. There's validation, it. right? 
There's a lot it of is validation, but you know, strings you, attached you still, to that, though. <laughs> yes, yes. You still have to turn it into a wire, and then you, and then once the wire hits, then you have that moment where you you celebrate for about thirty seconds, and then you're like, okay, now I actually, I actually have to get to work. Now right? the real work begins. The real work begins. Yeah. Yes. Hey, uh, Kevin, uh, we're already on an hour, and I appreciate that. But can you stand a few more minutes to talk about this uh, Level Up SaaS mastermind you've got going yes. and what, what that looks like? Sure. Yeah, so this is a mastermind that I've been running for two and a half years um, for SaaS founders and investors. Uh, the community has grown enough that um, we've, we're now running two monthly calls. Uh -huh. The first – Wednesday of every month we meet and talk about all things growth. So growth strategies, growth hacking. And that's um, you on the phone. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And, and then, what, yeah. what is the SaaS, you know, somebody, if I want to join a SaaS uh, mastermind, uh, do I need to be a specific size? Got to be doing 500,000 or a million or, or what does that look like? <laughs> no. Uh, but if you don't have a SaaS that's running at that level yet, um, then I would expect that you've had an exit in the past. So like we have guys that are between gigs, really, like they had an exit maybe six months or 12 months ago and they're looking for their next acquisition. So, um, but then otherwise, yeah, people are, they're from early stage to eight figures revenue. Yeah. And I don't have what any kind of mastermind people. is that? Like some masterminds you go to and it's a call and some others, like it's a lot of hand holding where they, you know. Yeah. You know, ours is, yeah, it's a call. It's a check-in call. We go through a process called breakthroughs and blockers, right? So yeah. biggest breakthrough since we last met and any blockers that would prevent you from hitting your goals. So we do set, we do set biannual goals and that you can track against. And really the magic, like any mastermind, really what you're getting more than anything else is networking. So um, what I tell members as they're coming in is, you know, you're never more than two degrees of separation from the expert you need on any given day. Yeah. Right. So like if you come to a call and you're like, Hey guys, I got this thing I got, I've got going on in my business. Could be anything. It could be hiring. It could be accounting. It could, could be, be capital. It could be yeah. uh, money. Uh, fine. Yes. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. Either the person you need to talk to is on the call or somebody on the call is going to connect you to that person in real time. Like yeah. before the call ends, somebody's going to be like, oh, when I face that in my business, this is what I did. And you need to talk to so-and-so and I'm going to connect you guys right now. Right. That's the that's the magic. It, it and then I have guys that come to me and say like, hey, I hit my goal months ahead of schedule because of this group, just because of the networking and the support and the interactions. One of the successes of a mastermind is how long people stay with the group because they, whatever money they put in, they get a three, 10 X return. What, what's that look like for your mastermind? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, I have people that are still on after two and a half years since I launched yeah. it. Um, the one surprise I've had is I've had a couple people leave the mastermind after making an acquisition, which to me was kind of counterintuitive. Like they kind of use the mastermind for networking and deal flow and deal structure and, uh, you know, everything, everything related to getting a deal done. And then once they did, they're like, oh man, I'm up to my eyeballs. Like I don't have time to dial into the monthly meeting. And, and it's, uh, and I appreciate that, but it's also kind of counterintuitive because I'm like, well, now that you're actually running the business, seems like you'd want the support from the network. Right. But um, but I do I I can say that I understand their perspective. Like when you close, the day you close, you feel like, oh wow, like the level of the uh, now I got my this life freaking list, up. like this long of things to do. Yes. And plus you may have investors, like if you're not self funded or even just partially self funded, right? Then you're, you've got investors to answer to, and you got you know the, you got the dynamics of the the exiting team. Like who are you retaining? Like, you know, it's just it's all of it. It's hard. Yeah. So day one is hard. So I get that. Um, in a way, I'd be surprised if some of these people didn't come back now that they've been like they 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 were in the mastermind. They completed an acquisition. They stepped away. Wouldn't be at all surprised if they came back at some point and said, "Okay, now I've got I've got you know." capacity for this again yeah I, I bet you they do right that's fantastic kevin 
we went past the hour and normally I, you know, it's usually an hour call, but I want to thank you so much for spending time with me. It was good time. So I really appreciate it as well, John. And, uh, I don't know, you and I can talk about this offline, but, um, I'd be happy to come back and talk just about fundraising. If that's interesting to your audience. Would love it. It is a hot topic. Everybody wants to know how to raise money from investors. Everybody like, cool. How do I buy bigger companies? You know, that's right. Well, say the word happy to do it. All right. I hope this video has inspired you. If you need help buying your first million dollar business, make sure to visit me at dealflowsystem.net. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe down below, comment on it, share it, tell everyone about it. And thanks for watching.